now I'm going to talk, take you uh, to through kind of the deep learning, what I call the deep learning revolution. So kind of the progress that has been within the last seven years or so in deep learning. And this was formerly known as neural networks, so that is an important ingredient there. So kind of the traditional uh, AI is kind of a more engineering approach, which is kind of illustrated by this cartoon where the where the kind of research PI asks, or the company manager asks for a system that can classify whether there's a bird in an image, and then the researcher says, I need a research team in five years to do this. And this is, of course, a, a kind of an approach that does not scale, and we'll learn about another approach where you have a data-driven approach, so you have general algorithms and a lot of data, and that combined means you can solve many different problems with essentially the same kind of approach. And here, at this point, I should say, Thank you to Tupani Raiko because Tupani, who recently left for doing excellent but very secret work at Apple, has provided a lot of the slides that I use here. Yes. Okay, so deep learning is hot in academia. So we heard about already DeepMind that has kind of uh, solved Go in a way, you can say, or at least has kind of been become better than humans. DeepMind also did. Uh, Previous to that, they also took a kind of big uh, a tie, uh, game, arcade, arcade games uh, simulators and used the same principles there and solved a lot of uh, games kind of at a super, superhuman level. And also, but also in, in other areas like speech recognition and image classification and in bioinformatics, uh, we see a lot of progress using these deep learning techniques. So this is a Google Trends plot that shows how the different concepts have been kind of becoming more or less popular. And you can see that actually for some time up to around kind of where we had this kind of deep learning revolution, then actually the term machine learning has been going a little bit down. But now after, after uh, this kind of comeback, it's been very popular again. And we, for example, I mentioned DeepMind already a lot. They were bought by Google for $500 million in 2014 and also all the other great players in in kind of these internet uh, companies, they are all going very heavily into machine learning. Yes, and even here there's a cover from The Economist, and The Economist had a special report uh, in the summer of 2016 where they, where they basically had a long section about deep learning. Yes, and here you can see the NIPS is the biggest conference in machine learning. You can see how there's been like a really uh, big growth in the popularity of NIPS, of the NIPS uh, conference. And deep learning is changing the world. Perhaps the most kind of exciting and kind of potentially disruptive place is in self-driving cars, because that can really me mean that the way that we, we our mobility and number of jobs in this sector will change a lot if we can get self-driving cars. And of course, like image recognition is a very important part of that. And I'll come back to that a lot in the next weeks. Here is also a kind of a, uh, a breakthrough in speech recognition that you most perhaps have realized yourself because you uh, probably use the dictaphone on your smartphone and that is now driven very much by deep learning. So you can see that kind of around 2010 where the kind of deep learning made its way into speech recognition, we have seen a big increase in the single word precision. So this again, x-axis is time and then the y-axis is the single word uh, error that these systems make and you can see it gone for more than 10% to something like 5%. And this change makes a lot of difference because on top of the single word model, we also have a language model and that can correct errors. And if you go from 10 to 5% error, then kind of the language, kind of the whole sentence level error will go down very much. So this me meant that actually kind of this deep learning approach has really been a mass uh, thing that a lot of us use now. Also within image uh, classification, we have had a lot of breakthroughs. So this is the so-called image net classification challenge. And the next slide shows how the uh, error on the top five uh, image 
classification task has developed over time and you can see the blue uh, bars that's before we used deep learning and the, and the uh, purple bars is after. You can see this big, big increase in performance in 2012 when the famous AlexNet was introduced and um, after that kind of there have been a lot of competition between for example teams in Microsoft and Google and now in, in 2005 the human performance was was uh, reached by by several systems uh, deep learning systems so so actually kind of uh, from 2012 to until today kind of it's been like more like tinkering with the same techniques that was introduced in the AlexNet and all these systems are also built on these fast computers and the GPUs because otherwise we could not really train them and that's the same for speech recognition. The methods that I use today on your phone was something that people invented in the 1980s, but they kind of gave up and went back to the hidden Markov models because computers was really too, the algorithms were too slow to train at that time. Yes. Okay, here are some other examples from what you can do with neural networks, deep learning. To, with, with some success, I think this is a little bit cherry-picked examples, but you can see you have a system, essentially this kind of AlexNet, that kind of takes the image and processes it, and then you have, uh, so you can see here it says CNN, that's a convolutional neural network, we'll learn about that in week two, and RNN is a recurrent neural network, we'll learn about that in, in uh, week three, so these things are put together here, so you take the image in, use the CNN to that, and then you feed kind of this final state of the convolutional neural network to a recurrent neural network that can generate a sentence so you can get a caption from this image and uh, you can see that different possible captions it's not like a one one to one that's the thing and of course you have from images that have captions that have been indexed on the internet you get a lot of training data this you can train on the lower is uh, example is more or less the same here we have put a so-called attention model on top of this so you can see for example when you want to generate the word frisbee it's a good idea of course to pay attention to that part of the image where you actually have a frisbee and so on and we'll learn about attention when we talk about recurrent neural networks here are we here we are trying to go the other way so we have a caption and we want to generate an image and of course this is very hard task because there's many different possible images that fit to one caption. So it, I guess this is uh, these are really cherry picked examples where it actually works. Okay, so the next example is actually something I've been a little bit involved in. That's one of our PhD students from our department. We made this latent representation model. We learn about that when we talk about unsupervised learning at week five. And in this latent representation, we can change the representation and then take an input image that's the left image. We can reconstruct it, but we can also kind of emphasize different attributes on, on, on in the latent space. So we can actually take the original reconstruction and kind of move it to a latent representation that is uh, more towards, for example, the latent representation that you have if you have eyeglasses or pale skin. And in that way, we can actually change the original image to an image that is, is that has this kind of feature. Okay, so let's try to place uh, deep learning and this approach about learning uh, from images to some tasks, for example, in a context of kind of what we used to do in machine learning. So the traditional way we did in machine learning was as engineers, we looked at the data, tried to understand the task, and when we did that, then we actually derived some features from the data so we calculated for example when we had images we could in, we could calculate what's called SIF features or we could subselect some of the features saying we threw away something said it's not informative for the task or we can try to project the data for example with a principal component analysis so this was a traditional way and that was partly maybe in a belief that we cannot build this so-called end-to-end system, maybe it was also because our computers was not fast enough, so we had to do it, so we kind of offline could calculate these features and then we could train our very computer-intensive algorithm on this lower dimensional representation. But nowadays we have faster computers and now we believe in this kind of deep learning way where we actually take the data and we try to solve the task end-to-end. -end. So that meaning that we build a system, for example, if we want to classify images that help, takes the image as an input and then in the end produces the classification. Yes, and what is the definition of deep learning? 
So deep learning is kind of a rebranding of the traditional artificial and uh, artificial neural networks uh, name, and LeCun has defined it as that it's it's deep if it has more than one stage of a nonlinear feature transformation. So here you can see a system that takes in an image of this yellow car and then in the first level feature representation it calculates some low level features and then these low level features are further processed into some mid level features and then in the end some high level more abstract features maybe some some features that kind of collects information so for example finds generic car parts like wheels and and, and lights and so on and then in the end you have some kind of you have some layers that actually kind of on these more abstract features then make a decision and all this this whole system is usually kind of trained end to end so it means that you kind of make an architecture which is primed towards learning these features but you don't design these feature extractors uh, as an engineer uh, offline and kind of the philosophy here is that if you do that you risk that you actually throw away some information because you put in some assumptions and and kind of by not doing it, you can let the system decide how to do what features are informative for the task. So here's a, a slide with some overview of different uh, sources that we will use throughout the course. Um, there's been a recent some uh, review articles in, in, in Nature. There are two books that were used in the course. In the beginning, of course, we we'll use Michael Nielsen's Neural Networks and Deep Learning. Uh, which is a very nice uh, introduction and also has exercises we'll use and then uh, kind of for the remainder of course we'll use this uh, deep learning book um, from Joshua Bencho and, and co-workers that are available online in a preprint format and then there's also a portal where you can find things and also the archive uh, article archive uh, contains and, and gets all the time new papers is a very active field.